I'm Eleanor Kagan. And I'm Ksenia Yarosh. Um, together we host a podcast called Bonnie and Maud, in which we take a female perspective on mostly film, but also TV and pop culture. Tonight, we're going to talk about hair. <laughs> so I have been obsessed with hair my whole life, um, and it actually feels somewhat strange to admit this, but I will say it is actually very wrapped up in the way that I feel about myself and my level of confidence and therefore how all of you see me um, and I'm wondering how you see me and I don't have a lot of it and it's blue so I can only imagine. <laughs> the perfect smurfette. Thank you. Uh, in real life we as women use hair as a visual representation of who we are, how we feel and who we want to be. Sometimes movies show this a lot of the time they don't. So all throughout this evening, we will be exploring how female characters in film and TV define themselves and are defined by their hair color, their hair length, their texture, etc. We'll also review the often conflicting stereotypes that are assigned to hair and how movies use these assumptions for better and worse. And of course, we will also get to the bottom of how we feel about ourselves and our own hair as a result of the pop culture we consume. There have always been goofy headlines of, can you believe she cut her hair? Was it for a role? She's so brave. But discussions about women's hair seems to have become even more panicked and confused lately. For every headline that suggests that short hair is in and pubic hair removal is out, there are two more that say the opposite. Once again, women's bodies are the subject of trend pieces, the conclusion of which is you can be a better woman if you have a lot of hair on your head, but not much elsewhere. And the fact that celebrities' haircuts make the news is also kind of insane to me. Um, but I think it reveals the importance that we place, whether we like it or not, on the hair of people we admire or we have a sick fascination with. And so when they change it, um, we can actually take it personally um, as it's like an affront to us and the way we see them. Um, and can we also just take a moment <laughs> and point out the ridiculousness that a haircut can quote unquote ruin a woman's career? This shit grows back and Carrie Russell is fine. And better than ever. No matter how progressive our parents were, so many of us first saw femininity in the form of the Disney princess. Well, what do we know about their hair? It's flowing, long, straight, or just slightly wavy, with the notable exception of the recent edition, Brave. Uh, it's also loose with one decorative element. Uh, they do have a mix of colors. I was surprised how many of the princesses are actually brunettes and redheads, but I still think a lot of little girls associate blonde with the typical princess. It's also worth noting that even though Disney has been trying to be a little more progressive uh, with Tangled, um, in that story, when the princess has her magical hair cut off into an adorable bob, uh, <laughs> it, it's transformed from golden yellow to brown. To me, that says brown hair is boring and ordinary, and that makes me sad. Um, and here we have some Disney villains. And I think it's significant that many of the Disney villains were older women who wanted to become or appear younger, which they went about trying to achieve by trying to steal something from one of the princesses. Um, and whereas princess hair is long and flowy and straight, um, villain hair is anything but. It's tucked away, hidden, it's edgier. I mean, look at Ursula's pixie cut. It's so awesome, I love it. I obviously love it. And it may be where I go after this, we'll see. <laughs> Um, but, you know, either way, they're not conventionally attractive. So I think even as we were children growing up seeing these images, we were already being taught concepts of good hair and bad hair by characters who are inherently good or evil. In film, on TV, and pop culture, a woman is often characterized by her physical features, her face, her body, her race, and her hair, which becomes a visual shorthand and is the key to... Things like social status, um, the time period in which the story takes place, her general outlook on life, whether she is a moral or ethical character, um, how stressed out she is, and her relationship status. I mean, you guys all know what single lady hair looks like in the movies. Or mom hair, for that matter. Or mom hair, and it's never that attractive. Um, but the quickest way to tell a viewer what a woman is like is through her hair, says the movies. 
Um, and obviously when reducing women to just their hair colors uh, amid mainstream Western standards of beauty, many patterns and paradoxes arise, uh, perhaps most so with blondes. The image of the blonde illustrates the ultimate contradiction of femininity, the virgin versus whore. On one hand, we think of innocent, cherubic little girls. On the other hand, we think of the ultra-sexual bombshell. It's interesting uh, that Marilyn Monroe has actually often played the bombshell who is totally naive of her sexual powers. And I find the blonde paradox really fascinating because on one hand you have this blonde virtue, on the other hand you have blonde vice. Um, it comes from a lack of nuance in historical female figures um, as either saviors or devils and nothing much in between and certainly nothing particularly normalized. Um, at the core of this paradox, you have two very famous ladies, the Virgin Mary and Eve. According to the blonde scholar Joanna Pittman, and there are blonde scholars, which is just great, um, in, the, uh, in the late 14th century, it was a woman, St. Bridget, who popularized the idea that the Virgin Mary was a blonde lady. Um, and so in poetry, painting, and in verse, Mary and Eve have sort of taken on these blonde statures to mean these two diametrically opposed things. Um, this particular piece, in which is from the early 15th century, you have Mary, who's blonde, but she has her hair kind of demurely tucked away. Um, Eve, on the other hand, her hair is pointing right at her boobs. <laughs> at one point in the 18th century in France, the dumb blonde stereotype actually arose because there was a play written about this famous, rich, self-made, but notoriously aloof courtesan named Rosalie Dufay. Um, and it basically painted her out to be a total idiot. And Parisian high society loved it, so the dumb blonde stereotype stuck. Alas. Brunettes. Uh, they mostly function as the opposition to the blonde. They are the foe. When blondes are assumed to be stupid, brunettes are assumed to be smart to the point of being totally uninterested in men and sex. <laughs> Dark hair is also often a means to indicate a rebellious streak, and when a brunette seductress appears on screen, she uses cunning, not her body like the blonde, to get what she wants. So whereas we have blonde and brunette, um, which have fallen in and out of fashion over the centuries, um, women have always had the ability to dye their hair to take on whichever culturally prescribed persona they want. Um, to the point of, even in the 70s, uh, dyeing your hair became a symbol of women's lip. Um, in ancient Greece, you uh, had saffron and mud to dye your hair. Um, in the 30s, Jean Harlow dunked her head repeatedly in Clorox bleach, sometimes ammonia, sometimes reportedly both, even though it creates a noxious gas, so who knows. Um, and last week, I used manic panic. <laughs> Redheads throw a wrench in the blondes versus brunettes conflict. <laughs> Did you know that there is even a redhead in Archie comics and she totally causes Betty and Veronica to fight even more than Archie? They're the surprise twist, the quirky, unusual other that's hard to pin down. Redhead characters are often shown as either a trickster character who is funny and silly and loud or as a witchy seductress. We'll hear more on this in an upcoming presentation. The blonde versus brunette conflict is a classic way to play up people's assumptions about women in general. Any conflict that may be happening on screen between two women is heightened if their hair is of opposing colors because it plugs into our assumptions of which one is good and which one is bad. The truth is, I'm usually rooting for the brunettes. I can't help my allegiance even if I'm a blonde right now. I wonder also if the blonde versus brunette uh, you know, stereotype originated in silent movies. Um, you know, you have two white ladies in a movie, how are you gonna tell them apart? Give them different hair colors. So, you know, even from the time celluloid was invented, um, you're still coding people, even if it's just at different levels of grayscale. Yeah, the biggest issue with this trope, which you can see is common even today in everything from comedy to drama, is that the crux of the blonde versus brunette dispute is usually a male romantic interest. You have to choose which side you're on for the sake of the story. When a blonde isn't pitted against a different woman with the opposite hair, she's put in conflict with a brunette within herself. <laughs> you might... <laughs> You might think the brunette evil twin is an old TV cop-out, but it continues to crop up in music videos and films to this day. 
And even when it's not an evil twin, the split of the same actress playing different roles <laughs> with a wig on plays into our anxieties of whether we chose the right path in our lives as women. And part of the reason women dye their hair in the first place is to reinvent themselves and play out the fantasy of, if I was blonde, would I be happier? If I was a brunette, would people take me more seriously? So movies like Sliding Doors and Lost Highway, and yes, even Taylor Swift videos, <laughs> allow us to live out these fantasies in film. So whenever you have a trio of women, you can expect that they will all have different hairstyles. <laughs> even if some of them are drag queens. Um, whether it's the blonde brunette redhead, blonde brunette pixie cut, blonde brunette curly hair, um, it's actually still unclear to me whether this comes from uh, you know, an image of women maintaining their own identities even when in a group, or if the director just could not tell them apart and thought that the viewer could not either. <laughs> it's not just hair color that offers us hints into what kind of person the woman on screen may be. Short hair tends to be a sign of quirkiness and rebellion. Curly hair tends to signify unpredictability and a certain wildness. In Working Girl, the lead character specifically makes her hair smaller to be more professional and possibly less feminine. In Greece, Sandy does the opposite by going from a neat ponytail to a big wild mass. There could be an entire show on subversion, but I think Reese Witherspoon specifically has done some interesting work subverting hair expectations. She has played a blonde who was feminine, but also super smart. And in Freeway, she twists the little girl look of pigtails by being the most badass little red riding hood ever. Um, so I think I have to say that my favorite trope of all is the hair transformation. You know, when it, it's always interesting when a woman changes her hair in the movies because it's usually a pivotal scene. Um, it, it always kind of brings to mind this idea of what does it all mean? What am I doing with my life? <laughs> so the woman on screen is illustrating the change uh, within herself outside of herself. Um, sometimes this takes the form of the haircut of distress. I think you guys all know what I'm talking about. Um, this is when someone is losing it, whether it is triggered by romantic troubles or just general life fucked up -edness. Um, Sometimes the only thing to do is head to the scissors. Um, on the other hand, a woman can transform her hair because she is exerting her own independence and seeking to take control of her life, after which perhaps she'll gain more confidence and uh, from the attention that a transformation brings you. And cutting your hair, which is, again, an impermanent act, um, is the quickest way to do this. So movie logic follows, change outside begets change inside, and it's often very emotional. On the flip side, there's the makeover, a common trope. They're irresistible, but it's interesting to note that in most movie makeovers, the change is imposed upon the woman by circumstance. You know, prom, becoming a princess, the usual. And another female character usually swoops in to undo the ponytail of someone who was previously an outsider. It can be a sweet moment of friendship and sisterhood, but there's still an element of now you've been fixed and your chances of getting a man and succeeding in life have been improved. So we are going to learn a lot tonight from our speakers about what to watch for in the movies and maybe what we shouldn't take so seriously. So we're gonna dive right in in a moment.